Rag for Peace. And um, because we are kind of constrained by time, I apologize for that, there won't be time for questions and answers. However, we do have a 15 minute, what I call stretch break, um, not a coffee break, but a stretch break between the two sessions this afternoon. And I would encourage you to talk to her. I think she came with a number of business cards so that you'll be able to follow up with her. Thanks, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so uh, my name is Reem Gunaim. As Susan mentioned, I'm a Rotary Peace uh, Fellow alumna from the Duke UNC uh, Peace Center. Um, I am very happy to be here with you today. Um, I'm currently actually a global, a global Peace Index Ambassador and uh, the Manager of Operations at the Rotarian Action Group for Peace. Uh, we are based in Portland, Oregon. I'm excited to share with you the work of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace and its relevance to the Rotary Peace Fellows and to Rotarians who are engaged in the peace area of focus. Um, I would like to give you some context. And in, in 1905, Paul Harris said that the road to war is well paved and the road to peace is wilderness. Um, since that time, Rotarians tirelessly started paving the road to peace. Um, their contribution to the Declaration, uh, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the establishment of the United Nations is um, undeniable contributions to global peace. And also, they started exchange programs to build mutual understanding. So they saw that peace could extend not just within their communities, but also to other communities around the world. Um, and today, for example, we're celebrating the Peace Fellowship Program that supports peace um, advocates and leaders around the world. Um, and also we have the Global Grants with the focus on peace. Um, Rotarians didn't stop there. In 2012, a group of Rotarians started uh, the Rotarian Action Group for Peace, and that's how it started. So what is the Rotarian Action Group for Peace? We are a semi-autonomous organization. Uh, we um, operate under the umbrella of Rotary International, and we are focused on peace, conflict, resolution, and prevention. We do that by engaging, empowering, and educating uh, for peace action within the Rotary global community. Uh, one of the roles of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace is to support peace fellows. And one of the ways we do that is by promoting uh, the peace centers within uh, Rotary clubs and districts and on our website. For example, we give our space in um, our office in Portland to local Rotarians to recruit and interview peace fellows. Um, another way we support Ro Rotary peace fellows is by providing a virtual peace library uh, that is is like full of peace resources available for peace fellows once they are members of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace. And those resources could be helpful to them in their studies and later in their careers. Um, our board currently considering giving a three years free membership to our peace fellows starting at their first year um, in the peace centers. One of the critical features of the Peace Library is the shared private platform uh, that Peace Fellows could utilize to work on a peace project together from different locations around the world. Um, so that is an, a huge opportunity for Peace Fellows to reconnect after graduation and do meaningful work together. So I invite Peace Fellows to check um, our Peace Library and look into that. An additional an additional role that the Rotarian Action Group for Peace uh, plays in catalyzing peace is by integrating peace fellows and Rotarians to peace initiatives. Um, we do that, for example, one of the tools we use is a peace map. And you can find the peace map on our website. The peace map is a tool that allows peace fellows and Rotarians to filter peace organizations geographically and also by area of peace. Um, the filtering system also useful for Rotary clubs and districts who are interested in doing collaborative work with peace organizations and peace fellows. In other words, the, the map brings us together. And once we start using it, 
it brings us together. So I invite everyone to look into the map. It's on our website. And if you need, it's really easy to use and it's straightforward. And if you wanted um, more instructions on how to use it, there's a webinar on the, our website that gives you instructions that you can um, look into. The map, for example, helps Peace Fellows identify, um, are you okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the map, for example, helps Peace Fellows identify possible peace organizations for employment. The map also helps identify peace organizations and Rotary Clubs for peace projects, seeking global grants from Rotary International. Um, Talking about global grants, we have on our website a section where we detail step by step um, how to apply for a global grant. And this is very useful um, instructions for peace fellows who are interested in um, seeking a global grant. In the light of what I said, In the light of what I said, I'd like to make some recommendations, and I would like to start my recommendation to Peace Centers and Peace Fellows. Um, the Return Action Group for Peace encourages Peace Fellows to integrate in their applied field experience component the design of a peace project in collaboration with Rotary Clubs or districts that we can submit to Rotary International for a global grant in the future. For Peace Funders, we encourage funders to become members of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace and uh, consider funding specific peace projects that will be posted on uh, the Rotarian Action Group for Peace website. Those could be um, possibly a projects of peace fellows. For faculty, we encourage faculty to become members of the Rotarian Action Group for Peace as well and support um, peace fellows as they engage in developing global grants projects and other peace initiatives. Uh, for local coordinators and host families, we invite you to familiarize yourself with uh, the Return Action Group for Peace website and what we do and our resources and help Peace Fellows get oriented with the organization upon their arrival at the Peace Center. Um, for Rotary audience, we invite you to engage your clubs and districts um, in the, or, uh, the, area of focus, uh, the peace area of focus and also introduce them to the work of the Return Action Group for Peace. In short, what the Rotarian Action Group for Peace is trying to do is to create a dynamic environment of peace where any action of any peace agent is actually going to catalyze peace in the world. Now, um, I would like to invite you all to join the Rotarian Action Group for Peace, and you can easily do that by going to our website and simply click on the join button at the upper right hand corner of our homepage and follow the instructions given. So you will see a join icon, just click it and then you'll have all the instructions. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the time to detail all um, the details now. Um, if you are attending the SAL convention, we will be there and we invite you to find us and we will be very happy <coughs> to have you at our booth and explain further to you uh, what we do. And also, always, you're welcome to contact us. And um, we, um, we have contact information on our website. And I'm all, I will be here in the coffee break. And feel free to approach me, and I'll share my contact info with you. Um, yep. Finally, I would like to thank you all for being here. And I would like to thank the Duke UNC Rotary community in North Carolina, uh, Rotarians and Rotarians around the world who support um, this um, great um, conference and great efforts by the, the, uh, the peace centers. Um, I would like to have special thanks and congratulations to our peace fellows. I'm so proud of you and I am very inspired by every one of you. Um, and I, I am there to encourage you and to support you at, and, and, and be your friend at any time. So please always feel welcome to come and approach me. And uh, special thanks to Amy and to Susan. Susan is one of my role models and uh, I'm very happy uh, to have known her. And I would like to also thank Barry, my host family. And um, I want to thank everyone again for being phenomenal beast leaders who are tirelessly paving the road to beasts along with Rotarians around the world. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Rim, for your presentation. So in the coming session, you will hear from Osborne Quena, who will inform us about enhancing capacity building in the water and sanitation sector in his home country, Kenya, which is in accordance with SDG 6, water and sanitation. And after that, my friend and uh, roommate Elohim Monard, <laughs> who will also talk about his home country, Peru, and speak about a strategy to reduce local level crime and violence. Elohim's presentation is important to releasing goal 16 on peace. So, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Thank you. So I'm called uh, Osborne Quena. I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow from the Republic of Kenya. I go here, I'm a graduate uh, student, a second year graduate student here at the School of Public Health, pursuing my MPH degree on uh, the Department of Environmental Science and Engineering. Uh, I was sponsored by the District uh, 5010, which is in Alaska. And today I'm going to talk to you about capacity building enhancement in water and sanitation, translating uh, uh, training indicators into practice. So I know most of you in this room have once attended trainings, either as trainees or as trainers. And uh, at the end of the training, you're, given, uh, you're told to evaluate the training process. Where I come from in Kenya, you're given a survey or a questionnaire at the end of the, uh, the training uh, session, and you're told to evaluate the training process, the trainer, the trainee. I've been, uh, Rotary gave me an opportunity to come out to America, and I realized after attending a training, they send you an email of the same. So they told you to evaluate the training process, what you're able to learn, and uh, it's, it's just essentially the training process. So today, my talk is going to focus on training evaluation that took place in Kenya, whereby government officials were trained on very relevant, uh, san on a sanitation program, and we wanted to see how uh, they were using the skills they were, training on, they were trained on. So this, is, this will be my outline, uh, my presentation plan. I'll talk about the introduction first, I'll go to the problem statement. Then I'll introduce a new concept many of you might know, many of you might not know. It's called a community led total sanitation. It's a sanitation approach that is being now carried out in so many countries. Then I'll talk about evaluation, my, now what I did, the evaluation of uh, the community led total sanitation in Kenya. Then I'll give my recommendation on the role for Rotary, of Rotary. So what comes into your mind when somebody tells you, define sanitation, or what is a sanitation facility. Here in America, this is the picture that comes into your mind, whereby you have a toilet seat, where you hygienically dispose of your human waste. You have a sink, whereby you wash your hands after using the latrine. Then you have a dryer, where you clean your hands, or you dry your hands to avoid cross-contamination. But is this the case all over the world? The answer is no. When you go to developing countries, according to WHO, 2.5 billion people still lack access to improved, to improved sanitation. So what do I mean by improved sanitation? Improved sanitation has been defined as a hygienic way of disposing of your human waste. So there's no human contact between the waste and the, and the human. So again, WHO tells us one billion people in the world still lack access to any sanitation facility. So as a result, as you can see from this picture, people still practice open defecation. And open defecation has health impacts. One, a lot of communicable diseases are transmitted through improper way of disposing of uh, uh, human waste, such as diarrhea. And this has a very big impact when it comes to ch child health. Number two, 
the women who practice, in communities where open defecation takes place, women are more vulnerable to attacks and rapes because they have to go and defecate in the open, sometimes at night, and you never know what is going to take place. So why does this matter? According to WHO, diarrhea is the second most killer disease in children under the age of five. As we speak today, according to WHO, 2,156 children under the age of five die every day through what? Diarrheal cases. And the children who are able to survive the diarrheal uh, cases, the recurrent diarrheal after the age of five, it slows down their human growth. Most of them are unable to grow well. They have stunted growth. And sometimes it affects also their cognitive development. So meaning they become a liability when it comes to uh, building the capacity of a country. And we know all this can be solved through proper water, sanitation, and hygiene practices, what we call WASH. And it has been shown to reduce deaths to a very big extent. So today I'm going to focus on one aspect of a bigger picture of when it comes to the water sanitation and the sanitation approaches. The approach I'm going to focus on is called community led total sanitation. So community led total sanitation is whereby a community is sensitized on the importance of stopping open defecation. So they're empowered and inspired. Then they make a decision to stop open defecation then they can, all, they can start building their own uh, uh, latrine facilities or sanitation facilities. From this picture, you can see one of these people here is a uh, facilitator. He comes into a village. He shows this, like the round mark here is the village itself. Then now these are the open defecation spots. So he, they come, they educate the community, like what are, these are the, the like if you open defecate, the community is vulnerable to these diseases. So, so the main goal is to trigger the community to stop this open defecation, then start building their own uh, sanitation uh, facility. CLTS was introduced uh, in 1999 by Professor Kamil Kha in Bangladesh. And after uh, around five years, it was able to be distributed. It's now working in over 50 countries because it is one of the fastest and the quickest way to, prevent, to make open defecation areas to be open defecation free. So CLTS approach was introduced in Kenya in 2007 by an international NGO, it's called uh, Plan International. After working in Kenya for around five years, they made so much progress. They were first, sorry. So it was first introduced in the coastal region in Malindi and in uh, Kisumu. So after five years, there was a lot of progress in terms of the communities that were practicing open defecation were able to stop open defecation. And the government thought this is a good way to scale up sanitation uh, programs within uh, the country because the government has infrastructure and they can be able to reach a wider audience other than, well, like, because uh, you know, uh, mostly uh, non-governmental organizations work in specific areas. But the government, they have offices all over the country. So they thought they will be able to reach a wider audience. So it was adopted in uh, 2011 by the government. And the government decided to use district government officials to be the key implementers of this uh, sanitation approach. As you know, this was a step in a good direction. But these government officials lacked the adequate wash strategies. Number two, they also lacked the soft skills to promote uh, this program, the CLTS, the Community Total Sanitation. And number three, despite the fact that they were being trained, they were never trained, their trainings never matched what was specifically in the context of wash. So that, those were the three gaps, human resource, capacity, and trainings. As you can see, the government is trying to build local community in Kenya. And this is in line with the sustainable development goal number six, whereby it talks about the need to enhance capacity building in developing countries when it comes to water and sanitation programs. And number two is to support local communities to improve their own uh, water and sanitation management. 
So my work basically was trying to build on this uh, sustainable development goal. So what did I do? So a point to note, this study was part of a larger study. So when I came to UNC, I was involved, I was incorporated in this uh, study by, by my peers and my advisor. So we went to Kenya, we trained 52 participants, government officials, in the two areas I showed you. And they were trained on specific skills, which is partnership, resource mobilization, and supervision. Then after that, uh, they were supposed to now use this information at, during their job activities and their normal uh, routine job programs. So our goal was to, to do what? To do the trading evaluation. And in order to do this evaluation, we came up with a conceptual framework. But today I'm just going to talk about the last aspect, which, the last outcome which we're targeting is to see how they're applying these uh, skills they're trained on to make the organization have a bigger impact, uh, to transfer these skills and make the organization, or the organization better. So some of the findings we got is one, the most commonly used skill by this government official was partnership. So from uh, the interview guides we administered to them, most of them were able to say that uh, there was improved coordination of programs. Number two, uh, communication has in, had increased better. And number three, they were able to collaborate with other partners because of uh, the, the skills they got through the training. One of them quoted, one, one of the court members, one of them quoted, just a part of the quote, they said like, the few meetings I've attended uh, where they, it was organized by the Ministry of uh, the Health, they were able now to collaborate, collaborate even more better uh, when they're initiating uh, sanitation programs and other wash programs. Number two, resource mobilization. So most of them said they were now able to write proposals. They never used to write proposals before, but now they're able to write proposals Though they're not getting the funding yet, but at least they're using that skill to, to write proposal to get more uh, donor support from both the government and, uh, uh, and uh, the international community. The number three, it was on supervision. So most of them uh, found it a challenge to conduct good supervision, or use the, their supervision skill, because one, they never got good. Uh, they never got a uh, good uh, reflective supervision from the national government, and number two, uh, they lacked staff. So there was a lot of understaffing within their their own offices. Like one of them told from the interview guides, they said like there are only two people in the office. One was a driver, and himself. So there's nobody to supervise who could go and assist him to do uh, carry out the tasks uh, or the programs uh, related to the wash or sanitation. So. What were my recommendations? So one, evaluation is key. So when it comes to uh, studies, we need to make sure we have an evaluation framework to assist uh, in evaluating programs so that uh, they can be used in uh, the WASH program. Then number two, if you train people on specific skills, you are able to have a lot of impact and a bigger impact than just training them on a general, uh, general scope. So how is it related to Rotary? As you can see from this picture, Rotary is basically involved, like uh, the WASRAG is basically involved in water and sanitation. And uh, training is also part of, uh, it, it can be applied in all the focus areas from peace and uh, conflict resolution to education to water and sanitation. Training is important. Evaluation of training is important. When it comes to specifically water related uh, and sanitation programs, we need to sustain, because Rotary is involved in a, a lot of uh, water sanitation and, uh, and uh, hygiene uh, programs, we need to have a way of sustaining these programs. And the only way to ensure that this sustainability is through the doing of proper analysis and proper uh, evaluation of the trainings that these programs are, are basically based on. So, in summary, I would like to conclude by saying uh, great thanks to the Peace Center here. I mean, uh, Susan has been awesome, and Amy, the board members, and uh, my fellow Peace Fellows. I love, I would also like to give acknowledgement to Jamie Bertram, my advisor, who was unable to be here today, and the people who incorporated me to the training itself, the, the program itself, uh, Johnny and Kate, to the lovely family of uh, Wickers, you have made uh, North Carolina and Chapel Hill a home for me. Uh, I'm always grateful for that. 
to Dr. Yeast, thanks for coming today, and to all my friends uh, from Kenya watching live, and to all my friends in the School of Public Health, I say thank you. Is it on? Yeah. Great. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask for the first question for Osborne. Yeah, let me. <laughs> Well, uh, while you're thinking of your questions, then I guess I will ask one. Um, one question I had was, what um, could you, yesterday we were talking about this um, at the bus stop, and um, I was wondering if you could tell me a, li a little bit more about the WASH framework, and you were mentioning that there hasn't really been one, and maybe to explain to the audience a little bit more about WASH for those that aren't, haven't really um, known much about it. Yeah, so we basically came up with a conceptual framework that was used to, because uh, we realized uh, WASH is a big field. WASH is getting a lot of funding, but there's no, and uh, there's a lot of training taking place in the WASH field, but there's no any training framework that exists today. The only frameworks we have is for the management training and other, other programs. So this conceptual framework was, I think, the third to be developed to be able to evaluate training progr programs within the WASH field. And I think uh, it would be very good if, uh, I think from here, the findings, we'll be able to replicate it in other WASH-related activities. Thank you. OK. Yeah. So I'm wondering, given all that Rotary does in the area of water and sanitation, I'm wondering what your personal plans are for continuing your ties with Rotary in working in this area. Thank you. So before I came to UNC, before I got the fellowship, I used to work in a, a wash, a water sanitation and a, a, a sanitation related activities in Kenya under IPA. So we made a lot of, we came up with a lot of uh, invention and interventions to be used in uh, helping mothers under the, with kids under the age of five to, I mean, to wash, to practice proper hand washing practice uh, proper sanitation and uh, treat their drinking water. And uh, I've been basically, like even in school now, we are developing materials with the World Vision to ensure that they're able to, now to implement and reinforce their WASH-related activities uh, with all over the world. So I believe, uh, and again with WASH, yesterday I was able to get some connections. So I'll be able to link up with uh, some of these uh, clubs that are working with water uh, sanitation activities so that we can see how we can enhance these activities. Hi, Art Cam, Apex. I've been abroad. I've been in both Africa and India doing infectious disease studies. And uh, it is just the health there. It's also the commerce in, in those areas as well. So I compliment you on your efforts here. Uh, and it is, it's, it's the issue. It comes in from uh, the communities on the hands of the workers. And the buffets get to be a real problem, you know, in those areas as well. So uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done there. And the type of pathogens that can be spread can be significantly dangerous. They're the large bowel invasive ones that, that cause, um, you know, that, 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 that cause more serious infectious disease as well. So uh, great efforts. My compliments. Okay, thank you. Others went up there. Hi. Uh, my question may seem a little bit silly, but... <laughs> um, I just wonder, because I know that this area has longer been funded, and it is not that expensive to be, build like latrines in the world. We have NGOs that do it. UNICEF has the WASH program and sanitation initiative. So why haven't like the society been able to tackle that yet? How, how are we failing to do it? So as you can see, uh, previously, a lot of sanitation approaches were being employed to tackle sanitation issues. One of them was like your, your use, use of subsidies, whereby you go to a community, you build a latrine for them, none of, and uh, the community members are never empowered. So most of them never use the latrines in the correct way. Number two was in terms of uh, uh, like coming up with this infrastructure, most of them have low standards, and the community members were rejecting, uh, the, uh, were rejecting these, uh, uh, these interventions. But this approach, I mean, it's trying to cover up because, you know, 
the only way to get a proper sanitation facility is to start by stopping open defecation. So this approach is basically, uh, let me say, one of the effective ways of stopping open defecation so that at least you can start moving to the, the idea of climbing the sanitation ladder whereby you are able now to now uh, have your own uh, sanitation facility. So that is the, the small contribution we are, do, we are doing. Uh, how about uh, the man, first you and then the, in the back row? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Paul Riz. I'm from the Slippery Rock Rotary Club in Western Pennsylvania, District 7280. And my question for you is one I don't think you can answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I joined Rotary in 1975, and one of the first projects we were working on was drilling water wells in Central America. And here we are in, uh, what is it, 2016? And we just finished a $70,000 project in Uganda at the Mustard Seed Academy, putting in a, a sanitation system and drilling wells. We've been doing this for centuries, uh, not centuries, decades. And how much progress have we made? Have we made any progress? How much is there left to do? I know it's a tough question. No, it's, it's a good question. Thank you for that. So a lot of progress have already been made, especially like, let's say in America, the sanitation uh, access is around 99%. 10 years ago in developing countries, so like sanitation and water related activities were 20 to 30%. But now we are now at 60%. So there's a lot of improvement done, but other areas are lagging uh, behind more than others. Like sanitation has been lagging behind because of the wrong approaches people have been using. Water-related uh, activities have been improving over the years, gradually. So we are just trying to see if we can bring now these, uh, these all components of uh, water sanitation hygiene to be at par. But progress has been made. Okay. Hi, I'm Melissa Mills from the Durham Rotary Club, District 7710. And my question is about the training. It sounds like a lot of the training that you are looking at and evaluating has to do with the implementer, implementers of the projects. And I'm wondering um, about the, the training for the communities and if, and if community leaders are involved in the training and then if they have a role in I mean, how do you get the buy-in of the communities is, I guess, what I'm wondering. Okay. So this project was unique in one way. Uh, previously, all the sanitation uh, uh, projects were involving community members. But in Kenya, the people said the problem is not us, the problem is the government. So instead of training us as people, train the government officials so that they can support our projects. So that is why we decided to train and evaluate government officials in this project. It's a very unique, unique case. But uh, just sister's project for this, we have a project in uh, uh, Ethiopia, and we have another project in uh, uh, Ghana, where community leaders are being trained on, uh, again, the specific skills uh, to do with uh, community-led led total sanitation. But for this project, we, uh, we had a, a, a new actor in place, who are the governments, and uh, we were trying just to see how effective they are in uh, uh, enhancing uh, the scale up of uh, the sanitation programs. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Osborne. This is extremely important. I've lived in a, a lot of different countries. One was a Muslim country. And I must say that I think the Muslims are very smart about doing clean things with their right hand and dirty things with their left hands. And it's something that we might consider, for example, opening doors with your left hand. I mean, and also washing your bottom with your left hand. Um, it just occurred to me that that's really important. And, and uh, that's where the Muslims have got it over the Christians. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm a Christian. <laughs> Thank you. My question is, um, 
what, uh, my name is BC Dash, I'm from the Durham Club, and um, water projects and sanitation projects are important the world over. Question to you is, does the remedy lie more in the urban areas or in the rural areas, and how do you distinguish between the two? And by the way, I think there are many religions other than Muslims who have that same trait. <laughs> So it all depends with uh, the country and uh, the setup of the sanitation uh, uh, practices within a country. I know in some urban areas where we have slums, sanitation is a big issue. There are some rural areas where nobody can access and they are so poor to even have their own uh, sanitation facilities. There is a problem. So it's a, it's a world of both, whereby in some areas in the urban areas, sanitation is an issue. When you go to some rural areas where there's no access, again, there's, that is an issue. But there are some rural areas whereby this uh, triggering has taken place and they've improved their, their own, on, the, on that scale. So it depends on uh, either of these areas. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for all the wonderful questions. Thank you, Esther. Hello, hello. Can you hear me there? Good afternoon. And welcome to Latin America. The next three presentations are now in our side. Since 1980 to the end of the 90s, we had the most, the bloodiest internal conflict in Peru. In the 90s, we had the last authoritarian uh, government of my country. Actually, tomorrow, uh, the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, the former dictator, is running uh, for president. However, I have to say that the most important threat now in my country in terms of peace and violence is not necessarily political violence. It is what I would say economic violence and it, I will measure it in terms of homicide rates and I will show you how. And I will talk about one city which is Tumbes. It's a beautiful city, beautiful beaches. They have resorts, these kind of things where tourists go. And, uh, However, in the city, we have a lot of violence because Peru is a, is a country of contrasts. We had a huge economic growth in comparison to our region in the last 15 years. We, however, we still have 25% of our population below the poverty line. And we are now above Colombia the largest producer of cocaine and exporter. We have all the chain. My point is that the new threat is the increase of violent crime in the northern coast, which is this part here. Paradoxically, this is the region who received most of the benefits of economic growth during the last 15 years. Everything started here in these two cities, Trujillo and Chimbote, but I'm going to talk to you today about this city in the border with Ecuador, which is Tumbes. Tumbes today is the city with the highest homicide rate in Peru. But we can see that the national average of homicides measured by a number of homicides by 100,000 people is today 6.7. Actually, it's one of the lowest in all our, all our region. I'm talking about South America and Latin America in general. But when you see to these cities with an amplifier, this number really increase. The two cities that I mentioned where everything started are these two, and then we have these two cities, 
Barranca here, and Tumbes, who really increased and break this idea that our country is safe, which is something that some politicians say. Now, it is important also because if you measure, compare it, better to say, with the most dangerous cities in the world, according to the homicide rate, Tumbes is among these cities. Actually, interestingly, Tumbes itself is not named in the ranking, but I found with my research that it should be included. Here is Baltimore to have a benchmark, by the way. In recent years, I would say in the last five years, the profile of murders in Tumbes, this small city next to Ecuador and with beautiful beaches, has changed. And clearly, there is a profile that we have to worry about. First, Murders, homicides, are happening in the street, are happening in restaurants, are happening in bars. They are, the, the perpetrators are using firearms, and usually almost half of them are because they are settling accounts. It means sometimes that they are uh, solving uh, issues of extortion, and in other cases, it is settling agreement again, uh, between gangs who are in the region or organized, we can say, networks of crime. Victims, and I could say that perpetrators as well, are mostly young men below uh, 29 years old. Actually, 80% of the victims are between 15 and 44 years old, and they are almost all of them are men. So this is the question that I want to answer with you first. What happened in Tumbes? Let's read together this idea from the Global Peace Index. Countries that have weak rule of law, high levels of intergroup grievances, and high levels of inequality are more likely to experience deterioration in peace as urbanization increases. This message is very important because urbanization is a subproduct of economic growth. However, economic growth in a context of weak rule of law, grievances, and inequality could be one predictor of a violence. Do you want to see what happened in Tumbes? This is urbanization in Tumbes in the last 15 years. If we see the uh, last 30 years, actually, it's even higher, this change. 95% of people are living in the city in this region today. Secondly, almost 9 out of 10 people in the northern coast, this region that I told you that is very dangerous today, think that their fellow citizens do not respect the law. And this is the map of the city of Tumbes. The red, this map is the map of poverty incidents. This red region here means that uh, the population there has roughly between or between 30 to 40 percent of poverty incidents. And this region here, it means that they have two, sometimes zero. So we clearly see here segregation, and we clearly see the also inequality. Actually, these places in red have very, very critical problems in terms of public services. Now, is it enough to explain Tumbes' situation nowadays and that sharp increase? No, it is not. So let's see the triggers. This guy is the former governor of Tumbes, on the region. Uh, he's a fugitive. He was governor between 2011 and 2015. He has huge accusations of 
and the nonsense of corruption. The mayor of Tumbes, of the city, is also a fugitive because of corruption. In, those, uh, in, these two, uh, per in, this, in this period between 2011 and 2015, we saw also the increase of violent crime. But it is not enough. As I said in the beginning, it is also an economic problem. And Tumbes has become a road, an important road to export cocaine in Peru. Because Colombia is a hub for uh, Central America or directly United States. And it has to pass through Ecuador by bus because sometimes it's easier than ports. And in addition to that, or maybe because of that, the price of cocaine in Tumbes is the second highest in all the country. And actually, when it crosses the border, it doubles. It's, I can tell you the, num the numbers is $2,000 per kilogram in Tumbes, and it could reach 4000 when it crosses the border to Ecuador. And finally, there is something that we call the cockroach effect. <laughs> I told you that there were these two cities that started everything, right? Well, because of law enforcement and other measures there, crime networks started to spread across the northern region. And one of the cities were Tumbes. Because of the reasons I told you a moment ago, and these triggers as well, Tumbes became a haven for criminals. So with all these conditions, new gangs started to appear, they started to ex ex new extortions, diversify crime, they have different crimes, these criminal networks, and they started to fight each other, and crime rate went up. Now, the next question is how to tackle this problem of violence in Tumbes. In my research, I embedded a framework from Caroline Moser and Patty McWilwain in three fields that unfortunately sometimes don't talk each other enough. They even have different languages, which are peace building, security, and development. I want to start with development. Public health is an approach within development that states that we have to address risk factors of violence. Use of alcohol, domestic violence, it was explained by Jean Lambert a moment ago, and also education is, according to this framework, within public health. Economic opportunities, we can say there is this idea that more jobs can reduce violence, particularly in young, uh, among young people. Then we go to security, and we have criminal justice, which is the most common approach, judiciary, police, and uh, penitentiary as well. We have citizen security, which is a wider approach than uh, criminal justice, which includes citizens in the process of uh, secu uh, safety and security in the city. And finally, in security, we have environmental design uh, which means to improve the infrastructure of the urban infrastructure. For example, more lights in a dark street could deter or reduce violence. That's what the approach says. In peace building, actually peace building mostly worked with a political violence before, but now we are trying to embed it for this a new threat. And uh, conflict transformation, is, for example, one of the several. In Central America, uh, the government is starting to negotiate with gangs. Uh, actually, it negotiated in Guatemala, Honduras, no, Guatemala, Honduras, and Jamaica. Sadly, it, ha it didn't work in the, in, the, in the long run. In the short run, it reduced violence, but in the long run, it increased. Uh, there, there we have human, there, then we have human rights because militarization and uh, increasing of repression could uh, threat human rights in different ways. 
And finally, we have social cohesions, with me, which means that we can improve social, uh, social relationships. So I explored with, with case studies and with data all these uh, different approaches. And what did I find? I find that citizen security is the best approach to include and to take the best of all of the other different approaches in order to address and tackle violent crime. How can we do it? First, with two pillars. The first pillar is civic engagement and social cohesion. In my research, I haven't found one case of reducing homicides in Latin America without including civil society, social organizations, even private sectors, let's say Rotary Clubs as well, and that have not increased the relationship between citizens and their social fabric. On the other side, human rights implies that we need to ensure that the government don't, doesn't use violent measures to address violence because it could have, it could drive, it could lead to more violence. So that is why human rights approach from the police, from the judiciary, from the government, entire government, and with a civil society watching it is very important. So these are my two pillars. Then we have a structural issues. As you can imagine, there are economic opportunities, health services, and education. But well, let's be more specific. Economic opportunities are not only jobs. Actually, there is no evidence so far that jobs, more jobs alone, can decrease violence. However, my thought, according to my research, is that decent jobs, jobs with benefits, jobs with good conditions, God who pay well enough, are more important for ad addressing, for example, inequality. Then health services, physical and mental, and finally education. Vanessa here later is gonna talk a lot about uh, education, particularly in early childhood, so I'm not gonna uh, elaborate on this issue. And finally, these three ideas. Information and data analysis. We are talking about how to measure it very precisely. Victimization, so it's if you say that you suffered uh, some uh, th uh, threat or crime. Secondly, records, which is that you really went to the police station or the judiciary. And thirdly, perception. The three of them and some details about uh, the information that you collect are very important. For example, I talked to you about settle settling agreements, right? And this, uh, in, if you see the records of the police, it says revenge. And actually, I struggled a lot in this year studying this to find what revenge really means. It could be a lot. Actually, it could be a passional uh, crime as well and some wife who is jealous. Then addressing risk factors, alcohol, crime, uh, access to, to guns, and domestic violence. We have talked here about domestic violence. We need to start at home as well and with victims, particularly women. And finally, law enforcement, and I would propose more a restorative justice approach, which is resocialization of the perpetrators instead of a punishment approach which is included in the criminal justice usually. So I have a list of recommendations and a list of a specific, a roadmap to, to address this, uh, each one of these different uh, points, but I want to uh, leave it here with three final me uh, messages for you. First, there is increasing evidence that violent measures lead to more violence. Secondly, this is not only a problem of guns and criminals. This is a social 
economic, and political problem. So we need a comprehensive approach. And finally, peaceful solutions require leadership, political leadership in particular. It requires a lot of perseverance. Crime will not decrease tomorrow, and homicides impossible that in one day to another with a new government that some people think. And finally, participation, and why I want to really underscore that idea. I'm not going to give you a list of uh, people because I've learned what as I, I can forget and I don't want to forget anyone, so thank you all. <laughs> Good afternoon. Nice to see so many familiar faces from past years. Um, this is particularly meaningful for me, may I say, just to start, because I did my doctoral dissertation on Peru 40 years ago in some of the same regions that he's talking about. So very interesting for me. And he's now, Elohim is now ready to take your questions. We are never ready. We are always ready. One all the way up there. You mentioned that the first item in the last three sentences, that violence breeds more violence. And you also mentioned earlier on that the violence may come from the government. To what ex extent can we extrapolate your sentence to a more global situation like what we had experienced in the Vietnam War? There was violence, and it was more and more troops sent, and more and more violence was the result until it finally boiled over. I was not expecting a, a question about Vietnam, but... <laughs> and I prepared a lot for this. Uh, I have to say that political violence is always something that uh, drives more violence. And because if we understand violence as, epide as an epidemic, like the public health approach states, we can say that it's a spiral. So wars... It's a different issue than urban violence. And sometimes wars have come to some equilibrium of power. That being said, I have to say that wars have to reach that equilibrium of power to bring a lot of deaths around the world. So that's why I would prefer diplomacy than wars. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Noah from the Methodist University Rotaract Club. Um, I was wondering, our Rotaract Club's having a panel discussion on gun violence actually on Tuesday. So I was curious about the situation, gun restrictions or gun laws in Peru. Good. Uh, in Peru, it's completely different than here. Uh, we need a permit to have a gun. Uh, however, there is a, we have a huge informal market of everything, including guns. And uh, most of guns are coming to Tumbes, the region I, I research, from Lima, which is the capital city, where you have actually uh, most, uh, the, most, the largest market of, of guns. I would say that the reality here is very different than Peru, but what, we can, I, what I can really state is that the more, the more guns you have, the more likely is that somebody is going to shoot another guy. I think we have time for one final question. John. 
Uh, John from Duke University. Um, it, Peru has a large Indian population, and I wanted to know if there's uh, anything, so race plays an issue in any of the violence or poverty that you're seeing up in Tumbres. I've tried to find some direct link between these uh, cultural and uh, in cultural inequalities with urban violence, and I, what I have found mainly is this idea of the inequality between rural and urban, and most of the people you are asking are in rural areas. So I would say there is, it is an important issue to, as a condition of the inequalities that we are living, but I would not say that what these populations in particular are more or less involved in these uh, problems. It is more, actually, it is an urban problem, therefore we can say, I, therefore we can say that most of these population are not there. Please join me in thanking Elohim for an excellent presentation. Do you like it? So we're going to take about a 10 minute uh, stretch break right now and try to get started again about 20 after.